So thank you, Emma, for being here today. It is a privilege to, to have you for an hour here. So I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Emma Katz. She's the author of the book, Coercive Control in Children's and Mother's Lives. She's also internationally expert, uh, well-known in domestic abuse and coercive control. And uh, her work has influenced legislation and professional practice in the UK and globally. Emma's research with mothers and children who have survived coercive control has transformed the understanding of domestic abuse. Children's experiences of coercive control were largely invisible prior Emma's book, which found that children were affected in of many forms of abuse inherent to coercive control, including imprisonment, deprivation of resources, constrained behavior, and isolation from the outside world. Emma's book is described as a pioneering work that will change how we understand and respond to children's experience and domestic abuse. From January next year, Emma will be an associate professor at sociology in Durham University. So let's give a warm welcome to Emma and thank you again for being here today. Hi everyone, thank you very much Anna. Um, so, um, yeah, I just wanted to mention around that um, that um, content warning for child sexual abuse. I just have one slide on that. And when I get to that slide, I'll just pause for a moment before bringing up the content of it. So if anyone wants to specifically kind of tune out of that slide, then I'll, um, I'll just give you a few seconds to do that. Um, okay, so this talk is um, going to cover how coercive control harms children. Um, and as Anna, as Anna said, I'm the author of Coercive Control in Children's and Mothers' Lives. And um, from next month, I can't believe it's so soon, I'll be starting at Durham um, as an associate professor in sociology. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, and um, feel free to follow me. Um, I have a Substack blog which um, covers all things domestic abuse. I just did a post yesterday about um, 10 red flags for domestic abuse and coercive control uh, which has been very well received and um, also follow me on Twitter where I have a thriving Twitter account with with um, over 23,000 followers, again, kind of dedicated to domestic abuse issues. And if you're an Instagrammer, you can follow me there as well. So please do keep in touch. So this is my book, Coercive Control in Children's and Mothers' Lives, published this year. It's the first academic book ever published on children and coercive control. It turns the focus to perpetrators and the ways that they abuse their children as well as their partners. And it demonstrates how it is the coercive controller's actions that are directly harming the child's world, their experience of life and what they can and cannot do each day. It shows positive outcomes for mothers and children during the post-abuse recovery process, where mothers and children who received timely and appropriate supports were able to build new family lives based on reciprocal care and mutual respect. And it calls for children and their survivor parents to be seen as co-victims and co-survivors. And in this presentation, we will explore what coercive control is, examine in some detail how coercively controlling fathers harm their children, show the ways that mothers and children attempt to resist fathers' regimes of coercive control, explore the relationship between coercive control and child abuse and neglect, and finally see the freedom and the positive family lives that are possible if people are so fortunate as to able to be in the absence of the coercive controller, which I know is not easy. So getting on then to what coercive control is, where there's coercive control, the lives of victims are seriously limited because coercive control involves situations where somebody subjects another person or persons to persistent and wide-ranging controlling behavior over a long period of time. Behavior that goes beyond the reasonable expectations that people have of each other in families and relationships, and they make it clear that standing up for themselves will be punished. So the perpetrators very much set up a situation of do what I say or else. 
The punishment for not doing what the perpetrator says may take many different forms. It might be violence, but it might not be. It's not always violence, but it will be something that the perpetrator knows the victim dreads, such as cruel verbal put downs, hurting loved ones, coercing the victim into unwanted forms of sexual activity, or economically abusing the victim. By repeatedly punishing the victim for their non-compliance, the perpetrator intends to demoralize and terrorize the victim into a state of permanent obedience. Not all domestic abuse involves coercive control. So there may be cases where there's verbal and physical violence and abuse happening within a couple, within a family, but coercive control is not present um, and it's happening for other reasons. But where coercive control is present, then it is particularly severe and serious. It causes high levels of harm and coercive control is a key risk factor for intimate partner femicide. So it's actually a much better predictor of whether an abuser poses a risk of killing their, their current or former partner. Um, coercive control is a much stronger predictor of that than physical violence is. So rather than looking at the history of the abuser's violence in order to determine the risk of lethality, we should be looking at how controlling they've been. Coercive control in families and relationships was criminalised in England and Wales by the Serious Crime Act 2015. And the Domestic Abuse Act 2021 includes an update that criminalised post-separation coercive control. The perpetrator is motivated by their deeply held and harmful drive to obtain control over the other people in their family and to maintain that control indefinitely for as long as they want it, perhaps five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. For perpetrators, this drive is so strong that it tends to dominate their whole life. Much of their time is spent pursuing, upholding and enjoying the control they seek and cultivating a positive public reputation that will reduce the likelihood that anyone will ever believe or rally around the victims should the victims come forward and ask for help. So all that time the perpetrator spends um, seeming like a great guy um, down the pub, on the golf course perhaps, um, doing volunteer work within the community perhaps, um, perhaps the time they spend online um, posting pictures of their happy family and talking about what a great husband and father they are, perhaps. Um, all of that is, all, is part of their coercive control because they're very deliberately and purposefully making sure that it's unlikely anyone will ever believe or rally around the victim should they come forward and ask for help. And indeed, so often this is exactly what happens. A victim comes forward and asks for help and the response they get from their community, thanks to the perpetrator's grooming of the community, is, we don't believe you, so-and-so couldn't possibly have done that to you, he's just far too much of a nice guy. The impacts on the family experiencing coercive control will include fear, confusion, self-doubt and self-blame, thinking that it's somehow, the victims will somehow think it's their fault, um, that, um, that they could do something to make it better, um, that um, they may be doubting how bad it really is. So sometimes they think it's really bad and then they think perhaps I was overreacting. It can't be as bad as I thought it was then because he's being nice now. Um, so, and children of course will often blame themselves as well. So there'll be a lot of self-doubt and self-blame going on. Low self-esteem, feeling really rubbish about yourself, trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, physical illness, because of course it's, um, it puts the most terrible strain on the body to be living in a state of continual fear and distress, and it makes you much more predisposed to develop physical illnesses. Deprivation, economic deprivation, social deprivation, that feeling of always walking on eggshells, trying to please the perpetrator, and just not being able to exercise self-determination over key areas of your life, where you can go, how long you can spend there, 
just not being able to exercise your preferences over food, clothing, hairstyle, appearance, not being able to express your opinions. Um, so many things that we take for granted, things that most citizens, most members of our community can do, the, the people experiencing coercive control won't be able to do those things. Their, their self-determination will have been radically shrunk. And even as this is happening, there will be attempts from victims to fight back and resist. Um, and this could take place in many different ways. It might be quite covert. For example, they might just sometimes refuse to think about something the way that the perpetrator insisted they think about it. They might hang on to their own feelings about it quietly and, and in a hidden way. Um, or fight back could look a lot more obvious. It might involve um, physically fighting back against the perpetrator, throwing objects at the perpetrator, calling the perpetrator nasty names back. Um, there are many different so there's a whole spectrum of resistance and fight back from the very covert and hard to spot, um, the very hidden, to the much more overt and obvious. And there will be attempts from victims and survivors to speak the truth about what is happening, um, perhaps to their friends or their loved ones, perhaps to professionals, though not always. And there will be attempts to protect themselves and other victims in the family from further harm. And these may not be attempts that professionals might necessarily understand or recognize, but to the person doing it, it will make sense that they are trying to protect themselves and the other victims in the family from further harm. And coercive control is definitely on the spectrum of gender based violence. Research by Michael Johnson and colleagues from 2014 in the United States found that 22% of women had experienced coercive control from ex-husbands and 5.4% of men had experienced coercive control from ex-wives. Analysis of the Crime Survey for England and Wales by Andy Myhill in 2015 found that out of a group of women and men who had reported experiencing some kind of domestic abuse, they ticked some box on the survey that indicated they were a domestic abuse victim, 30% of those women, but interestingly only 6% of those men had had experiences severe enough to be called coercive control. Um, and that was determined by Myhill um, going off whether they ticked two boxes on the survey and those two boxes were to say that their partner had repeatedly belittled them to the point of making them feel worthless and made them feel frightened by threatening to hurt them. So of all the women and the men saying that they would had some sort of domestic abuse experience, perhaps some violence or some psychological mm -hmm. abuse had taken place, 30% um, of those women were ticking both those boxes to say their partner had repeatedly belittled them to the point of making them feel worthless and made them feel frightened by threatening to hurt them. But interestingly, of all the men saying that they'd had a domestic abuse experience, 94% of them were not ticking those two boxes, which makes you wonder you know about the nature of their domestic abuse experience if those boxes were not being ticked and, and how it might have been different from a coercive control experience in finland between 2014 and 2017 there were 139 district court cases for stalking where there'd been a relationship people had been dating cohabiting or married then they'd split up and they'd had one or more children between them and then stalking had taken place. And of these cases, only eight out of almost 140, that is about 5.8%, had involved a female stalker and a male victim. In other words, at least 94% had involved a man stalking his ex-partner and, and, and the mother of his children. So um, finally, 97% of perpetrators actually convicted for controlling and co coercive behaviour in England and Wales in the year ending December 2020 were male perpetrators. So looking at these figures, and, and I could have brought up more studies as well, but looking at these ones, I think it's a picture emerges where this is something that is experienced by women in much greater numbers than by men. There are a minority of male victims and survivors of coercive control for sure, but for the most part, it is women experiencing this. And for the most part, it's women experiencing this from male perpetrators. Um, of course, coercive control can take place in both heterosexual relationships and also in LGBT plus relationships. 
So um, we shouldn't forget about that side of things as well. Um, coercive control directly harms children's own lives. So now what we're going to do is we're going to draw extensively on chapter four of my book, Coercive Control Harms to Children. This chapter is based on my qualitative interviews with 15 mothers and 15 of their children who had separated from male perpetrators of coercive control. It was the child's biological father or their father figure who had been the perpetrator. Um, the accounts of these children and mothers showed that children had experienced coercive control alongside their mothers. They'd been co-victims and co-survivors of the father's coercive control. These children were harmed not only because they were witnesses to the coercive control that their father was directing at their mother. In other words, they were not only being indirectly harmed by a seeing, hearing or knowing about the ill treatment of another, father's coercive control was also directly harming children's own lives. And responsibility for causing this harm lay with the abusing fathers, not with the survivor mothers. And in the following slides, we will see how this took place. So I think this is where things are going to get quite heavy going in terms of content. Um, there will be lots of quotes from mothers and children about their experiences. So as we said at the start, please do take good care of yourself. And if you need to tune out, that's absolutely fine. So yeah, the following slides do contain sensitive material, including descriptions of violence and of child abuse. Do take care of yourself while listening and feel free to, to leave the room, to put your computer on, on mute, anything that you need to do. So um, children were affected by their father's isolation of their mother and his control of their mother's time, movement and activities. The kids couldn't have any friends around because he'd kick off or something. Kids' parties were another problem because he'd be accusing me of trying to have sexual relations with one of the dads, so parties were out of the question. We couldn't do any after-school clubs because he insisted I had to be back home by a certain time and the clubs finished after that time. Me and the kids weren't allowed to go around to see their grandparents. I just didn't go out, so then the children didn't go out. It was just school and home. So they missed out on days out, family trips, socializing with people. And they've missed out on knowing what healthy relationships are about in other families, because children don't make as many friendships if you can't mix with other mums. If I wanted to go shopping, then I had to take a speaking child with me and he would ask them where we'd been and what we'd been doing. So father's control of mother's movements outside the home could severely restrict children's social lives by preventing them from engaging with wider family, peers and extracurricular activities. These restrictions were especially experienced by younger children who were more reliant on mothers to facilitate their access to friends' houses, playgrounds and days out. Father's controlling tactics could severely limit children's opportunities to create resilience building relationships with non-abusive people outside their immediate family. Children gain social skills, confidence and resilience from positive experiences with grandparents, friends or in after school clubs. But because of father's control, children were instead living in the same isolated and lonely worlds as their mothers. And in the case of Isabel, the father was also making his children contributors to the regime of constant surveillance that he was subjecting their mother to. So imagine um, that you're one of Isabel's children and you, you have to go with her whenever she leaves the house so that, that your father can interrogate you about where she's been and what she's been doing and who she's talked to when you get back. So imagine you were going around the supermarket and a male acquaintance, a male community member just casually says hi to Isabel um, and that's it, there's no conversation, but he just perhaps waves and says hi around the supermarket. Um, and then you get home and dad's going to interrogate you about, about who she's spoken to and, and what she's done. If you report that to dad, you'll probably know that it's pretty likely that he will fly into a rage, that he will punish Isabel, that he'll be extremely jealous. Um, and he'll be paranoid that this male who said hi was having an affair with her. 
if you don't tell him, well, that's pretty scary as well for a child because, you know, you want to be truthful, you want to be honest. And, you know, what if he finds out some other way and then he realizes that you didn't tell him, then he'll be furious with you. So the, making children surveillance agents of their mother is incredibly um is incredibly abusive of the father and and um, we shouldn't underestimate that at all. Um, children's educations could also be directly undermined by fathers. So again, Isabel explained how her husband had repeatedly told the children they shouldn't bother to do their homework. Incidentally, he also told them that they shouldn't bother to clean their teeth, to observe a bedtime, um, and that they could basically do whatever they want. Isabel suggested that that this father was attempting to present himself to his children as fun and heroic while casting her as the baddie, the one with the rules, the one making them do the things they don't want to do, thereby increasing his power and influence over the children while isolating and disempowering her within the family. The impacts of fathers manipulating children in this way should not be underestimated, both in terms of the impacts on children's education and on their relationship with their protective mother. Um, children also um, were, were greatly affected, directly affected by the father's choices to use tactics of imprisonment and neglect on, on his family. As one 11 year old girl said, he would lock us in the house. As another mother said, there was no food in the house. He would buy expensive food for himself and I was living on water when I was breastfeeding. And next, we're going to hear from um, Eloise and her 20 year old son, John. Now, for the most part, I interviewed mothers and children separately. That was always my preference. So they could talk freely without being in each other's presence. Um, but in Isabel and John's case, this mother and son, um, sorry, in Eloise and John's case, this mother and son, they were adamant they wanted to be interviewed together. So whenever I bring up quotes from them, they're kind of chipping in on each other's sentences. So I just want to explain to you that's what was going on there, that that was an unusual case of a joint interview at their request. He tell us that we couldn't touch the food in the fridge, that we weren't allowed to eat. He'd lock us in the house a lot of the time so we couldn't get out. He'd unplug the phone. He'd take out the power because in the hall, we've got an old electric box where you can take things out and that's it, you've got no power. He used to take an element out the central heating so we'd have no heating. He'd lock us in the house and go out. He'd take the Wi-Fi so John couldn't do his homework and I couldn't do my banking on the computer. So we were prisoners in a way. These behaviours from fathers, particularly the deprivation of food, risked severely damaging children's health, and if taken far enough, could have been fatal. And we do quite often hear in, in the press about children who've been starved to death in their homes. And I would always urge people to, to question whether this is a case of coercive control before jumping to conclusions that the mother was evil. She may not have been evil. It may have been that she was under a regime of coercive control herself and she had no power to stop the father from, from starving the children. And of course, if, if a father was so violent that he was capable of starving the children, then he would have probably killed the mother for leaving. So, so she probably couldn't have left to save the child's life either. And mothers in these circumstances do reach out for support. Um, you know, there have been cases where children have been starved to death in their homes and the mother had called the police 20 or 30 times for domestic violence and the police had never done anything substantial or effectual to remedy the situation. So it just continued. <clears throat> Father's decisions to, at their whim, subject children and mothers to the experience of being imprisoned <coughs> can be understood as a form of severe psychological abuse towards them both. These father's actions may have made these children feel powerless and perhaps given them the message that, that they were bad or worthless because a child might rationalise this imprisonment and this not being allowed to eat as that they must be bad or worthless, which of course they're not, but, but how can it make sense to a child that, that they are worthy of love and care and respect and good treatment if they're being treated this way? 
Such examples again highlight that children were experiencing father's coercive control alongside their mother. Both the mother and the children were direct victims of the father's crimes. Preventing mother-child interactions was a really common theme that many participants spoke about. There was no fun, no playtime allowed. Like when my daughter Leah used to want me to sit and brush her hair, that wasn't allowed because he'd be jealous. He'd say, you've spent enough attention on her, what about my attention? And Leah herself said, it felt like mum wasn't there because I didn't spend time with her or anything. And Marie went on to say that she had recently left Leah's father. The separation was quite recent and um, at the time of interview. And she said that, at, that post separation, Leah's personality had started to emerge for the first time, age 10 or 11. And that, um, and that Leah had started to tell jokes for the first time and that this was not something she was able to do with her father present. So I thought that was um, that was very illustrative of just how how um, how harmful the regime of coercive control was to the development of Leah's personality and the expression of it. And then a child in another family said, I think he was jealous of me and my mum's relationship. I know he was jealous of me because if I was ever with my mum, he would come into the room because he was jealous and say I'd be cuddling up to my mum and then he would come and I would walk off because I didn't want to cuddle up near him. And a child in another family saying, lots of times when mum was giving me attention, he'd tell her to go over to him so she'd have to leave me to play by myself. And Shannon's mum, um, who I also interviewed, talked about how it was absolutely awful for her to have to to have to leave Shannon to play by herself that she was that she was devastated and felt incredibly guilty at having to do this but of course she had to do it because if she didn't she'd be punished so preventing mothers and children from spending time together contributed to maintaining father's dominance in families Children described feeling confused, sad, annoyed and angry at being unable to spend time with their mothers. The limited maternal attention and restricted opportunities for fun and affection that fathers were imposing on children and mothers may have contributed to withdrawn or aggressive behaviours in children. And it may also have contributed to distress, depression and anxiety in mothers who were continually prevented from being the loving and attentive mothers that they wanted to be and that they would have been had their partner not turned out to be uh, an abuser. There was also a great deal of discussion around how children's behaviour was distorted by the coercive controller. As one child said, I would be sort of quiet. I didn't shout out or run around. And as a mother described, when he came home from work, he'd want to spend time with them and they were always his girls. He used to say to our daughter Zoe, you're my little angel. But at the same time, they couldn't shout. They couldn't make noise. They couldn't be children around him unless it was on his terms. It was all right if he wanted to play with them, but at other times it was like he wanted them to disappear. If he wanted to do something like go out for the day or something, we were supposed to be like little puppies. Like if he, like if he wanted to make a fuss of us, we were supposed to be like, ooh, ooh, thank you, master. And if he let us down, then we were supposed to say, oh yeah, okay then, fine. The kids were only tiny and you'd know as soon as he came through the door, we'd be playing, me and the children, and you'd know as soon as he was coming home because the atmosphere would change, because all of a sudden there were certain things we couldn't do because it might upset daddy. If we were laughing, we would have just been told to shut up. It was just a completely miserable experience. It was just angry and miserable and grumpy all the time. So there was no fun in the house, no laughter. So what we see here is that young children had to constrain their own normal healthy behaviour in order to comply with their father's demands. Children were harmed by living with a narrow space for action within their homes. That is, they had very limited freedom to say and do normal age-appropriate things like laugh and run around noisily. 
If fathers were in the mood to engage with their children, they expected children to switch effortlessly from a state of disappearance, non-existence and silence to a state of gratitude and affection. Mothers and children were not supposed to show normal emotional responses when fathers let them down, an unhealthy constraint of their real feelings. Fathers therefore appear to have enjoyed a state of non-accountability within families, able to act however they wished without experiencing any consequences. So here I'm going to mention child sexual abuse and I'll just pause for, for 10 seconds in case anyone wants to turn off the computer or, or um, you know, turn the sound down or leave the room for a moment while I just go through this slide. So child sexual abuse was described by one family who I interviewed, Lucy and her daughter Zara. The father in this family had sexually abused Zara when she was under five years old. Abuse that Lucy had only discovered post-separation when Zara began to make disclosures. According to Lundy Bancroft and colleagues, in their 2012 book, The Batterer as Parent, which is a really great book, Incest in these circumstances is usually, though not always, perpetrated against daughters rather than sons, and it is strongly linked to father's sense of entitlement, self-centeredness, and belief that they own the child. And of course, father's sense of entitlement and self-centeredness and their sense of ownership over their partner and children fuels their coercive control in general. Bancroft et al. suggests that these perpetrators are not sexually attracted to children per se, rather they are aroused by situations of sexual dominance and power imbalances. Sexually abusing children who are dependent on your parental care is clearly one such situation. These perpetrators are also likely to be simultaneously sexually abusing their adult girlfriend or wife, whom they can also dominate and have power over during sexual activities because of their coercive control. Okay, and um, I'm, I'm done talking about child sexual abuse, but I am going to talk about physical violence towards children in the next couple of slides. So again, if you want to tune out of this, that's absolutely fine. My dad asked me and my half brother to like sort out his paperwork for his work and we did it and we got a bit mix mixed up and so he like hit us to the point where we had to go to school the next day with makeup on because he like bruised us and stuff. He'd force me to swim, wouldn't he? Yeah, he'd force him to swim when he didn't want to and the abuse he used to give him when he didn't win the swimming competitions was awful. He was continually belittling John, saying how fat and lazy he was. My son wouldn't do things like make his own sandwiches. He'd be too scared of doing it wrong. So children were being given age, appropriate, age inappropriate tasks to do um, or made to compete with other children and then were brutally punished by their fathers for not completing the task perfectly, um, even though that, that was unlikely because it was an age inappropriate task, or for not winning the competition. The effects of such punishments, the ways they drastically reduce children's space for action, are evident in Sybil's son's avoidance of making sandwiches in case his father perceived, perceived him to be making them incorrectly. As with adult coercive control victims, as outlined in Stark's groundbreaking book, Coercive Control, children were keenly aware of the threat of punishment that hung over them as they went about their everyday lives. And they were constraining their own day-to-day -day behavior and micro-policing themselves to try and avoid being punished. And that of course is exactly what adult victims do as well. They constrain their own day-to-day -day behavior and they micro-police themselves to try to avoid being punished. And one father seemed to have specifically punished his child for resisting his coercive control. As the mother explained, my kids, they've always been opinionated. And that's one of the things he didn't like about our daughter, Roxy. Like when he got violent with her, when she was four to seven years old, he'd say, you're just like your mum, because I'd argue back at him and Roxy's also very opinionated. So he kind of knock it out of her and then she was more quiet, more reserved in what she did, more cautious. Roxy was punished by her father for being opinionated like her mother. 
This father's belief that he was entitled to an obedient child as well as to an obedient partner led to him using violence against them both. As this father narrowed his daughter's space for action, she became quiet, reserved and cautious, possibly because she was fearful of further punishment. Roxy, as a four to seven year old child, therefore seemed to have experienced classic coercive control at a very young age. And classic coercive control in a nutshell can be described as the perpetrator made the victim and survivor fearful of negative consequences. And this coerced the victim and survivor, in this case, his young child, into compliance. Um, so again, the child experiencing it just the same way that the adult would do. Okay, so now I want to talk about mother's resistance via positive parenting. And um, I think we'll take a little bit of um, a more positive tone here, because um, I know that these last few slides have been really heavy going. Um, but of course, this is the reality for some children's lives. So it's really important that we do talk about it. But now looking at mother's resistance via positive parenting. It's important to note that most mothers being targeted by coercive controllers tend to do what they can do to keep their children as safe, well and happy as possible. Though their ability to do this can be limited by the father's determination to abuse in ways that harm the children. Anything the mother does in this regard can be seen as her resisting coercive control because she is upholding her own notions about how the children should be treated and not deferring to the abusive father's notions as he demands she do. Even though mothers cannot stop a father's choices to use harmful behaviour, positive parenting from mothers is still a major factor in helping children to cope with father's domestic abuse. Mothers are cited more frequently by children who live with domestic abuse as their most important source of help than anyone else in their lives. Their relationship with their mother is most children's major support in coping. And if you ask children themselves who has helped you the most, um, they're most likely to say it was my mum. Now, not all children say that and not all mothers do this, but that is what children are most likely to say. And so now we're going to have an exploration of how children and mothers were resisting together. Because coercive control inv involves perpetrators trying to fundamentally change the nature of the victim survivors everyday lives so that victim survivors everyday lives become totally devoted to pleasing the perpetrator. Much of children's and mothers resistance to coercive control takes place at the level of their everyday activities. Mothers and children did try to maintain everyday lives that were tolerable and included some experiences of autonomy and self-fulfillment. By resisting father's rules when possible, children and mothers strengthen their sense of independence. So as Eloise described, her and her son did things together. We went to the cinema or we went shopping. We could just let our hair down and do what we wanted to do. We were going to the cinema two or three times a week to get out of the house. And you may be asking, where was the money coming from to go to the cinema that often? And the answer is that I think Eloise's father, her son's grandfather, um, knew that something was wrong in the marriage. He may not have known the full extent of it, but his way of helping was to pass her cash when he saw her and I'm guessing that, that for some reason she was able to keep a hold of that cash, the perpetrator wasn't able to get it off her, and she was using it to go to the cinema with her son, perhaps when the perpetrator was at work. And then her and her son continue, when we would come back with shopping bags, sometimes we had to hide them. We used to throw them over the hedge into the garden so he wouldn't see them clothing or anything that I bought John because he would go mad that I had spent money on John. So what may look like an ordinary bag of shopping that a mother and son have bought back from their, their time in town shopping was actually a symbol of huge bravery and defiance from this mother and son. Many children and mothers also seized opportunities to resist restrictions within the home and times when fathers were either absent from the home or were sleeping were particularly useful. 
Well, some days he would be out and me and mum would watch a movie and have some time together, which he wouldn't let us do when he was there. He, also, he always made my daughter Shannon, then aged one to six, sleep on her own, you see, but she wouldn't go to sleep without me being next to her. So I'd wait for him to go to sleep and then I'd get in next to her or she'd get in next to me. By spending time together against father's wishes, children and mothers were providing each other with emotional support, reducing one another's isolation and maintaining some closeness in their mother-child relationships. Um, and children also resisted by supporting their mothers. My son, John, has been so emotionally supportive. He would say to me, mum, don't go to bed tonight in his room, come and sleep with me. So I get into John's bed and John had a bean bag and he'd lay on the floor and say, shall I put us a movie on mum? What do you want to watch to cheer me up? My daughter Jane really did get me through it. She was really close to me and massively supportive. There were lots of hugs and she made me pretend cups of tea with her plastic kitchen set. I made this wonderful fairy tale world for her upstairs in her bedroom and we spent most of the time when he was at work together up there. And I think a major theme in these examples is children and mothers exercising their imaginative capacities and immersing themselves in shared imaginative experiences and enclosed worlds. So obviously each time you watch a movie, you kind of enter into the world of that movie. When you play with, when you play with your child with their little plastic kitchen set, you're entering into an imaginary world with them where things kind of take on a different meaning than their real meaning. Um, when you when you sort of um, when you play with fairy tales, when you when you're in a in a world that's decorated with fairy tales, um, then again you're entering into an imaginative world that you and the child or you and the mother share. So the emotional supports provided by these children highlight the important roles that children were playing in their mother's well-beings. Children's actions were often commonplace and inappropriate and on the surface did not seem to be acts of resistance to abuse. Obviously, most children and mothers watch movies together. Most of them play, play with plastic kitchen sets and, and, you know, talk and think about fairy tales. But in these circumstances, the children's actions can be greater significance because they took place in contexts where fathers were directing a campaign of verbal, emotional and psychological abuse at mothers with the aim of making them feel worthless and useless. These children's efforts to support mothers partly countered fathers' campaigns of abuse by giving mothers a sense that they were valued and liked and that their feelings mattered. So, I now want to think about child abuse and neglect and its relationship to coercive control. The usual approach to the issues of domestic violence and child abuse and neglect is to separate the two issues out from each other. People who take this approach tend to say that two separate harms are taking place. One, children's exposure to domestic violence and abuse against their mother, and two, child abuse and child maltreatment. And the law usually separates these two issues out with different legislation around domestic abuse and different legislation around child abuse and child maltreatment. The problems are usually seen as separate and distinct. But I think this is an ineffective way of looking at it where coercive control is taking place. Oh, my slide's just a little stuck there. What's going on? There we go. However, Exposure is an unsuitable term for children experiencing coercive control, because as we've seen, what perpetrators are doing in these contexts has such clear and distinct impacts on children's own lives. And you can't be exposed to your own life. You can only experience your own life. And furthermore, every action that perpetrators were taking that was harming children, they were taking because of their intense drive and motivation to control. The similarity of what perpetrators did to mothers and did to children was not only one of motivation, it was also one of impacts. In many of the children's behaviours and emotions, we can observe the behaviours and the emotions of the classic adult woman coercive control victim survivor. 
Children, like their mothers, had internalized the knowledge that it was dangerous when the perpetrator was upset, and they had drastically modified and constrained their behavior to try to avoid negative responses from him. Children, like their mothers, were often isolated and deprived. So child abuse and neglect and coercive control are deeply intertwined and categorizing them as two separate issues makes little sense. Rather than attempting to separate them, it's my belief that children in these circumstances should be recognized as child victims and survivors of a campaign of coercive control, a campaign that included the perpetrator subjecting them to acts of child abuse and neglect, as well as to other aspects of coercive control, such as severely restricted freedom, monitoring and stalking, and all the other acts of coercive control that the perpetrator committed with the aim of getting and keeping control. And of course, the adult victim and survivor should be recognized as a victim and survivor of the same campaign of coercive control. Coercive control is a phenomenon that includes many strands of abusive behavior that harm both adults and children. It encompasses abusive acts towards the victimized parent that may amount to crimes, abusive acts towards the children that would be categorized as child abuse and neglect, and many other harmful behaviors that may or may not also amount to crimes. So to represent this visually, all of this is coming from the abusive parents' coercive control. That is the overarching problem that is creating every other problem. So the abusive parents' coercive control is what is leading to the coercive control of the victim survivor parent. It's what's leading to the coercive control affecting the child victims and survivors. It is what is leading to the acts that would be classed as crimes towards the victim and survivor parent, such as um, assault, stalking, sexual assault. And it, was, it would also be classed, um, and it's also contributing to the acts that would be classed as child abuse and neglect towards the child victims and survivors. So finally, as we draw towards the end of this talk, I'd like to think a little bit about the possibilities for recovery from coercive control. There's a lot, lot more about recovery in my book than I have time to cover here, um, but I would just want to touch on it here to, to leave things on a, on a more hopeful note that there, that there may be light at the end of the tunnel. So once a mother and child break free from a perpetrator and achieve safety, and this is a very difficult, dangerous and lengthy process, but if they can somehow get through that process, it is possible for them to start recovering. Um, and very often the, the very systems that should be helping them to achieve safety are in fact working in the opposite direction and making it more difficult for them to achieve safety, unfortunately. Um, for this to happen, for safety to be achieved, for recovery to start, a mother and a child need to be largely free from post-separation abuse. And achieving that is pretty hard because most perpetrators are determined to continue and even escalate their abuse post-separation. And it can be very difficult to get an effective systems response to get perpetrators to stop that, um, to make it impossible for them to continue it. Mothers and children also need to have very limited or no contact with the perpetrator. And again, that is hard to achieve because not all perpetrators do go to family court. Some don't. But if they do go to family court, unfortunately, the pro-contact culture of family court is such that it's very likely that the perpetrator will be given frequent contact with the children, which they can then use to, um, to continue their post-separation abuse. So again, difficult. And also in order to um, be able to recover and be safe, they need to have a place to live where they feel secure and safe and they, they need to have enough money to live on. And again, this is increasingly difficult um, with, the, with the cost of living crisis that's currently happening to be able to be safe away from the perpetrator and have enough money to live on while you're there. And achieving all of this can take many years and mothers and children can face many obstacles and it shouldn't be this hard and systems need to, to really rethink the way they're doing things to make achieving safety a lot, lot, lot easier. Um, but 
at the moment, I, I want to acknowledge that it is really, really hard. And for some survivors, the obstacles are simply insurmountable. For example, the mother tries to protect the children from child abuse by telling the family court about the father's history of child abuse. She's, she's then accused of being a parental alienator and the children are put into the father's full custody and she gets to see them for an hour to a month if she's lucky. So for some survivors, the obstacles are absolutely insurmountable. And again, I want to acknowledge this because I don't want to make it seem as though it's overly easy because that is insulting to survivors and it's not survivors' fault that it is so difficult. It's because our systems are not pulling in the right direction to help them get free and safe. But for the mothers and children in my study, they had eventually, for the most part, got to the place where they were quite free and safe. And for some, this had taken years. Um, and it's not necessarily the case that all mothers and children can pull this off. It's just that those were the mothers and children who wanted to um, take part in my study. They wanted to, to share their experiences, but they may not be representative of all survivors. So, Looking now at, at children being in safe environments where they can thrive and what that looks like. Remember the boy who wouldn't make his own sandwiches because he was scared of doing it wrong? Well, his mother describes how once he was safe, he has so much more confidence now. He's like a different boy. Now he's more willing to do things because he knows he won't be criticized by me like he was criticized by his dad. He finds it much easier to relax. Now we just have a laugh. And now we can just sit together and spend time together. And I'd say we're considerate of each other. We're sensitive to each other's feelings and emotions. And I'd say we have fun. The house that mum and I live in now may not be a mansion. It was a little council house that they've been given. But I love it here. It's nice and cosy and it's just better and it's the best. And mothers and children also talked about how post-separation and once they were free and safe, um, they were really enjoying both the increased freedom that they had and the positive connection they had with each other and with their communities. My daughter and I have started going to storytelling events at the library and we've been to the hairdressers together and we've been out for a meal a couple of times, which is really, really nice. We just love life at the moment. It's brought us all closer and we're much happier than we were then because then we were all dull and we didn't like life much. And now we're all happy. We feel we can do anything we want. And I think that's a really important quote. And I love that notion of them going from being dull to being happy. I almost see that as when they were living under the regime of coercive control, it was like life was in black and white. It was very, very limited and dull. And when they were able to exercise their own freedom of choice, exercise their own preferences, when their autonomy had been restored, including the children's, of course, then it was like life had been turned up to Technicolor. So to conclude, in this webinar, um, or this talk, I'm not sure if we're calling it a webinar or a talk or a seminar, but whatever it was, we have explored what coercive control is and what behaviours it involves. We have examined in detail how coercively controlling fathers harm their children. We have seen the everyday and often hidden ways that mothers and children attempt to resist fathers' regimes of coercive control. We have explored the relationship between coercive control and child abuse and neglect, arguing that abusers carry out um, what would be classed as child abuse and neglect as part of their regimes of coercive control. And finally, we saw the freedom and the positive family lives that are possible in the absence of the coercive controller. So this is my book, Coercive Control in Children's and Mothers' Lives. Um, what I've talked about today is mostly drawn on chapter four, um, but there is a great deal more in my book. So um, do feel free to, to check that out if you're interested. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Dr. Emma Katz. Um, and as I said at the start, I have a new blog on Substack discussing all things domestic abuse. So please do follow me on there. I have a thriving Twitter account, again, discussing all things domestic abuse. So I'd love you to follow me on Twitter. And if you're an Instagrammer, you can follow me on Instagram too. And these are the references that I use today. I'll make these slides available to Anna so that if you want them, um, 
that she can send them out to you and and obviously um that there's the recording as well so um i'm sure that'll be accessible as well thank you brilliant thank you so much emma that was a really really interesting talk um lots of food for thought in there and i think coercive control is something that can often be quite tricky to get your head around and quite tricky to understand because it crosses such um such a wide kind of strands of, of different forms of abuse and, and, and across the social space in that way as well. Um, mm. So hopefully everyone's found that um, really, really interesting. Um, Anna, did you want to mention, oh, Anna's just put in the chat a couple of things. Um, she's put a link to the Ask Me project, which is um, a project that is run by Pain Children's Aid that's around training community members uh, about domestic abuse and, and what makes a good response to the community. And we've also put a feedback link in there um, I'm just highlighting all this before we go to the Q&A because we'll, I'm sure we'll get stuck into a really good discussion. Um, if you could, before you leave today, um, click on that feedback link and just give us give us a bit of feedback about today's event, that would be really helpful. Um, Anna, did you want to mention something about the next events coming up and then we'll move into addressing some of the questions people asked? So I'm going to, just going to mention this, so then we can move to the Q&A uh, session and, and then we can let people go. So we have two events next week. Um, one is uh, a workshop about online abuse against a woman, how to keep safe, and also how to respond if someone comes to you uh, concerned about being victim of this kind of crimes. And the last event we have for the 16 days of action will be um, a, a speaker, Dr. Midna, who has done research about uh, domestic abuse in Asian origin women and uh, how uh, was the response when they seek support from specialist services or reported uh, domestic abuse in East Anglia. So it is a really eye-opening research. Uh, what, what she uh, discovered, and there are really good advice about how we can do better. So that's uh, all from us, and we would like to move on to um, Q and A question. So yeah. do we have any questions, for this, Sophie? I can um, see a few that have some oh, things in the chat. Yeah, I was just going to say there's some things in the chat that I, I can see that I'd love to address. Um, I can see that Erica has said that. Um, has posed a question and and she's going through the the family court hell that I mentioned briefly in in my slides um I don't know what I don't know what you can do about that because the family court is is so tricky uh, when they are hell bent on on keeping um shared custody um I mean some thoughts are perhaps you could get an expert witness to to um, write a report about the um, your son's state of mind and the impacts that the contacts having on your son um, if you if it's possible perhaps you could get your son some 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 private counseling or therapy or therapeutic support but I know that might not be possible because sometimes the court forbids the mother to do that without the father's permission and the father won't give it um, and it's, it's such a difficult situation and my heart absolutely goes out to Erica and to every mum who's going through this. Um, and I know that it's very tricky in, in the Netherlands as well, um, where, where the, parental the parental alienation belief system and ideology is pretty strong there. Um, so um, mothers who are trying to protect their children from abusive fathers are very often constructed as alienating mothers and punished by the courts for their protective efforts. Um, so I, I would suggest perhaps trying to get an expert witness to um, to write a good report about it, um, make sure it's somebody who has a good understanding of coercive control. But again, I understand if, if even that's not possible because the court might not even admit the expert witness testimony. Um, I think you're doing the best that you can and you're just trapped in a system that is torturing you. So I'm, I'm so sorry about that. Great, thank you, Emma. Um, there's a couple more questions and comments in the chat. So Angie's put, um, just thank you for your excellent work and, and the way you share it so generously. Pointed out um, that it's such a shame how much abuse that you get on Twitter and on social media for speaking out about this. I think that's something that we see a lot, that women who speak out on these issues are often the target of, of online abuse, unfortunately. Um, yeah. and I, I, I block them all and I try not to think about it too much, but of course, 
but of course we, I shouldn't have to go through it in the first place and I'm um but yeah then they're, they're not going to they're not going to silence me anytime soon but I shouldn't have to go through it in the first place well we applaud your courage in dealing with it um and Andy's question is what can we all do in our daily lives to support victim survivors and not collude with the abusers well that's an excellent question because so often so many people do collude with abusers um accidentally um because they they haven't quite identified abusers darvo tactics so darvo is a very common tactic of abusers and it stands for um the d is for deny uh, the abuser denies that they've ever been abusive um so their whole history of abuse they deny and then um, the A stands for attack. The abuser attacks the credibility and character of the victim, saying that they're an alienator, saying that they're crazy, unhinged, vindictive, vengeful, um, perhaps taking any example where the victim fought back, self-defended themselves, and then using those to say that the that the victim is actually the violent and abusive one and the abuser is actually the victim. So that's the, the final part of DAVO, the, um, the RVO, reverse victim and offender. So the abuser denies, attacks and reverses victim and offender, making it seem as though the abuser is the victim and the victim is the abuser. And so often we, um, everyone falls for the abuser's DAVO tactics, the communities, the neighbours, the social workers, the police, the family courts, everyone falls for the DAVO tactics, unfortunately, pretty often. So I would say that um, there's many different ways we could try not to fall for the DAVO tactics. Um, I would say that when you're looking at a victim and survivor um, who's genuine and who is the genuine victim and survivor, they will have been through an extensive period of self-doubt and self-blame during the abuse. And they may not still be in that period now. They may have come through that and now be very clear who the abuser is. But they will remember that extensive period of self-doubt and self-blame. So if you're trying to identify who is a genuine victim, um, and who's an abuser using DAVO, ask them some questions that try and get at that, that extensive period of self-doubt and self-blame and see if they can provide a good description of that. Um, because a genuine victim and survivor will have no problem describing that at all. Um, because they'll remember what it was like to blame themselves and doubt how bad it was. Um, and they'll remember what it took to get them to a place where they where they did come to realise that it wasn't their fault and it was really bad what they've been through. The abuser will have a lot more difficulty, I think, um, in in describing any kind of self-doubt or self-blame because, because they're so over-entitled and they're so self-centred that it would be hard for them to ever imagine doubting yourself or blaming yourself. So I think it's harder for them to, to fool you around that particular aspect. So that's 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 a tip of mine. Um, and, and I would just ask also around, um, you know, what were the things that you felt you had to do and what were the things that you felt you couldn't do because of how X person would react? Again, a genuine victim and survivor will have a very long list of all the things they felt they had to do or they couldn't do because of how their partner would react or their parent would react. Whereas a perpetrator may have a go at faking that kind of list, but it won't sound as genuine and it won't be as extensive and authentic sounding. Um, so, um, yeah, that's, that's my kind of, uh, my kind of advice for, for trying to distinguish between perpetrator and victim. Um, and of course, that's the foundation to not colluding with the abusers. Um, and then if you're in a position to write reports, um, you know, if, if, uh, if there are people who are report writers in our audience today, try to um, emphasize the perpetrator's responsibility throughout the report. So don't talk about domestic abuse, talk about the perpetrator's domestic abuse. Right, and right. don't talk about, you talk know, about, you know, uh, oh, sorry, there's an echo there. Don't talk about the um, the couple having a fight. Talk about the perpetrator, you know, um, the perpetrator causing the fight with their incessant, unrelenting control and 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 their many varied abuse tactics. So um, try to avoid mutualizing and make it very clear in a report who is driving all of this. The perpetrator. Um, so yeah, those are my answers around that. Um, it, it kind of it, obviously it's different depending on who we're talking about in terms of not colluding with the abuser whether we're talking about as a community member or as a professional but those are those are my thoughts yeah brilliant thank you for sharing that 
Um, I think it's something uh, that I know we talk about sometimes within Cambridge Women's Aid is the fact that, you know, all a perpetrator needs you to do is do nothing actually. So it's very easy to collude with perpetrator by just mm. looking away and, and kind of going along with the idea that there's nothing to see there, there's nothing, there's nothing unusual or wrong going on. Um, so that's another kind of another thought. Wendy's got- Very true. And, and, and actually that just brings something else to mind that I guess a way that you can, can counteract the perpetrator is by treating any survivor that you encounter with great care and respect because the perpetrator will have treated them you know um with no care and respect and they probably got pretty used to being treated with no care and respect if you can treat them with care and respect if you can tell them all the things you like about them point out their strengths point out um the ways that they've tried to resist um and, and how strong that shows they are um and you know point out that domestic abuse is is often comparable to torture so you know they that they've not they've not been through something small they've been through something extremely serious you know they are basically survivors of torture in a lot of cases uh, and whether or not they've ever been hit that's not the point it's um the severity of the psychological abuse can amount to torture um so um yeah i would i and just treat them with a lot of respect um treat their opinions with respect treat them as though they matter all of that helps to counteract the perpetrator's narrative that they are you know stupid and useless and that no one cares about them and that no one will ever respect them um so that can be really powerful um I, like my my mantra around that is be the opposite of the perpetrator where the perpetrator has disrespected them you need to respect them where the perpetrator has undermined them you need to support their decisions even if you don't necessarily agree with them yeah, brilliant i think that's really good advice um i can see that wendy has put a question as well in the chat just mm -hmm. kind of more a practical question of how do we report this and to who so i suppose this is kind of um, addressing maybe some of the systems that are in place you know for, for recognizing course control and how and how do people report it and what might the response be um, as well well, in England and Wales, um, coercive control is a criminal offence under the 2015 Serious Crime Act. Um, so um, if you're reporting it, then I would report it in those terms and make it clear that, that this is a crime that's being committed. Um, the police should know that coercive control is a crime, but of course, sometimes they their, their reaction is is not necessarily coming from that place and sometimes the reaction can be you know well if so and so hasn't been hit then there's nothing we can do about it so remind them that it's actually a crime under the 2015 um serious crime act um but obviously it, i guess it depends on who when, when you say reporting it are you talking about survivors reporting it or are you talking about professionals reporting it um, it kind of depends on the situation but I guess we are talking about crimes here so so probably the people to initially report it to are the police but of course um that's not always an <clears throat> not always a <coughs> easy path to go down um <clears throat> do you have any thoughts um Anna and Sophie about how this can be reported and to who I'd like to throw that one out to maybe some of our outreach workers who are here today, because I think this is something we do talk about within Cambridge Women's Aid and some of the difficulties maybe, especially with um, the systems in place and, and, and the kind of helping professionals that survivors rely on to be able to recognise coercive control and act appropriately. So I don't know, does Susie or Roe, either of our outreach workers or anyone at Cambridge Women's Aid want to, want to comment on that? I'm happy to say something, it's Susie. Um, I think we're still really struggling with the idea, um, with certainly um, when reporting to the police and also in the courts actually, you know, um, seeing coercive control is still not, I don't think, understood as well as it needs to be understood. Um, there's still references made to, you know, she's not, there hasn't been any physical violence. Um, and I, I don't I don't think people are still understanding how this can affect or does affect both the children and and um, the survivor. But those are my thoughts, really. Um, I think there still needs to be a lot of work done on it. Um, I think 
as I just wanted to add, as a if you're a professional and you suspect that this is going on, um, or if this you think this is happening to a friend or family member, I think the best thing you can do is encourage them to speak out and encourage them to speak to a specialist service like us at Women's Aid, um, who can go through safety plans and kind of help give them the knowledge and the information that they need to make an informed decision. Um, I think it's important not to take decisions out of their hands um, and make sure that you're empowering them um, because they already have enough control in their life um, from the perpetrator. Yeah, and I think as well, and on top of that, believe them, you know. Absolutely. That's one of the best things that we can do is believe them and, um, yeah, give them the space that they, you know, give them the space for action um, by empowering them. Um, so. Brilliant. Thank you, Susie and Ro. Um, and I think that really chimes, Emma, with what you were saying there about be the opposite of the perpetrator, you know, rather than narrowing their space for action, increase it and rather than disempowering, do all we can to empower someone. Um, so yeah, thanks very much, Susie and Ro, for that. Um, I'm keen to go to Arya's question. We've had um, a few more questions in the chat, which are really interesting. So Arya has mentioned, and has brought up the issue of, have any of the women in the study um, been immigrants or those with insecure immigration status? And have you come across experiences where immigration complications or no recourse to public funds have been used as weapons of coercive control? Oh, absolutely. Um, not personally in my own um, research, um, my own data gathering, but I, but in other studies, absolutely. Um, it's really common because perpetrators will, will exploit any avenue they can. They will exploit existing areas of vulnerability and create new ones. And of course, if you have an insecure immigration status and no recourse to public funds, that is a huge vulnerability for perpetrators to take advantage of. So absolutely, they use it all the time. Um, so people with no recourse to public funds are, I think, at a higher risk than, than, than the average person of, of being abused just because of the enormous weapon that that hands to the perpetrator. Oh, Anna, did you want to say something? No, I think you had um, another question ready, isn't it? Um, I've just I've just spotted um, Angie's question, quite a practical question again in the chat, that she's struggling to get hold of a copy of your book. We're all major fans. We, we would love to get your book. Um, and that she's got an order with the Oxford University Press, but no luck. Where's the best place to try and get your book? Anyone who'd like to read it actually? Yes. Oh gosh. <laughs> well, um, so I um um the the book initially had a, uh, the first print run but it sold out before it had even come out it sold out in pre-orders and i am told by oxford university press that that copies are going to be delivered in early december so now-ish though obviously the royal mail strike might have delayed it a little bit um but the last i heard it was going to be early december for the oup copies but if it if they're still not turning up then you could have a go at cancelling the order with oup there are plenty of copies on amazon.com in the united states um so if you can sort of spare the extra 10 pounds to ship it from the united states that's the, the best bet of getting hold of a hardback at the moment because there's plenty of hardbacks on amazon.com in the united states um but um it is available as an ebook and as a kindle so you can read it here you know with no problem at all as an ebook or a kindle it's just there's a bit of a shortage of hardbacks here at the moment um yes i i believe me i i wish i could do something about this i'm really frustrated by it and i've um i have i've emailed the publishers many times but um apparently there's global difficulties with 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 um supply chains and it's not not just affecting my book but many others apparently but um that my advice like i say if you want it immediately is to order it off amazon.com um in the united states and have it shipped over but obviously that's a little more expensive um but um if you want to read it immediately um read the kindle or the ebook um wh smith has an ebook version so you can click through to buy an ebook version which is 25 pounds um via the WH Smith website. Um, but yeah, I want more hardbacks. I want them in stock in the UK. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, there's a couple more questions in the chat that I'd like to address just before we come up to the end. I think we'll finish at half 12. Um, Lauren has uh, asked, which she said is, this has been really interesting, so thank you. 
And would it be possible to talk a bit more about how coercive control can become stalking post separation? Oh, absolutely. I think at least half of stalking all, all stalking crimes are ex-partners um, stalk, you know, stalking their stalking their exes, particularly um, ex-boyfriends and husbands stalking their ex-girlfriends and wives, um, because stalking is quite quite gendered when it's ex-partnered, um, when it's ex-partners doing the stalking. Um, and, and it's all just an extension of power and control tactics. You know, it's wanting to monitor you all the time. You know, when they were in the home with you, they could monitor you more um, more easily, but when they're not in the home with you, they have to use other methods to, to monitor you. So they, um, a lot of perpetrators are using different forms of technology to, to stalk. So they may not be physically standing outside your house, but they may be putting trackers on your, on your phone or your car without your being aware of it, and then monitoring you that way. Um, Refuge has some good guides to um, responding to technology-based stalking. Um, and of course, there are national stalking services that, that, that people can get in touch with. Um, and, and I believe there are remedies for stalking that are being rather underused by the police at the moment, um, like anti-stalking orders that are being rather underused at the moment. But it's all an extension of power and control tactics, and it's pretty common for post-separation stalking to take place. And it, that's just another area where our systems are not responding very well to the threat these abusers pose. I know in France they've started electronically tagging stalkers. Um, um, they've started electronically tagging domestic abusers. And of course, that's a big um, obstacle to those those abusers carrying out stalking because they themselves are being monitored for, for where they are and how close they are to the survivor. Um, and it'd be great if we could go down that route in this country and electronically tag domestic abusers um, so we can keep an eye on where they are. And of course, and there's been campaigning, hasn't there, for a national register of, of domestic abusers. And that would be great if we could ever adopt that here, but the government wasn't keen the last time it was looked at. Um, so yeah, those are my thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I can just see Kat's comment in the chat. I think this is relating back to Wendy's question about reporting. So Kat says um, that she used to work as an IDBA and it was a battle with some officers um, around getting them to understand first control. However, the specialist domestic abuse officers are much better to deal with. When reporting to police, I would encourage the women to ask for domestic abuse trained officers. Obviously, if those are available, I suppose that will change um, based on where you are. Um, but Kat has also said being based in a police station helped break down some of those barriers. So thanks mm. for that call, Kat. Um, I had one final question um, before we come up to the end. There's, there's nothing else in the chat at the minute. Do you think uh, Emma, that abusive men don't understand the harm that they do to children, or do they understand fully the impact of their behaviour and they just don't care? I think you'd have to be pretty um, unthoughtful to not notice that your child was living in the same isolated, lonely world as you've got your partner living in, that your child can't see their friends. I think you'd have to be pretty unthoughtful to not notice that you're that you're beating your child, sexually abusing your child, um, to psychologically abusing them, calling them fat and lazy, making them so terrified they won't even make their own sandwiches. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how you could possibly not notice that you were doing all of that. Um, so um, I think that perhaps perpetrators don't necessarily have that drawn to their attention very often because professionals don't tend to even notice that they're doing this. Um, I know that, there, that some, some studies have suggested that, that when you bring the harm that they're doing to their children, to their attention as part of a domestic abuse perpetrator program, that they are quite responsive to that. They care a little bit more about that than they care about the harm they're causing to their partner. Um, but whether they can actually in the long term change their behavior towards their children is a whole other matter. Um, because it's pretty ingrained behavior, just like the, the behavior towards the partner is very ingrained. Um, but I mean, I think that I think that perpetrators are very clever and calculating in what they do a lot of the time, you know, especially the more controlling ones. Um, they're very strategic, you know, if, if they can, if they're strategic enough that they only show their abusiveness to to certain people at certain times, and then they put on a much more charming face to other people at other times, then that shows a level of calculation and, and cunning that 
that, that is present in their behavior. Um, you know, if they're showing violence and abuse to everyone, including, you know, when it would not be beneficial for them to do so, then then perhaps they are a little bit more out of control. But if they're, show, you know, if they can make a judgment about when it's a good idea to show which face to who, then they, they do know what they're doing. Um, there was a study by Susan Heward Bell. She's a fantastic Australian researcher who's looked at, at perpetrator behaviors. Um, let me just put her name in the chat actually, because um, I know it's a little bit complicated name. Um, so um, I would look up her work. Um, and she did a study on how perpetrators are deliberately using mothers, mother child relationships against them as a tactic of coercive control. So they're sabotaging these relationships and hurting and harming the children because they know how much it upsets the mother and how powerful a tool of control it is over the mother. And they interviewed some perpetrators, Susan Heward Bell interviewed some perpetrators who were going through a perpetrator program. And one of them said um, that why did I target her mothering? I was doing it deliberately. I was targeting the thing that I knew would hurt her the most. And obviously having, being on the program, he was willing to say that. Um, he was willing to kind of say the quiet part out loud, but I think a lot of them do, do know exactly what they're doing with that. Brilliant. Well, I think if there's nothing else in the chat um, and we're coming up to the end of the time that we've put aside for this today, the, the kind of the main thing that's left is just to really, Give you a really warm um, and sincere thanks, Emma, for, for the work that you're doing actually to advance people's understanding of coercive control of the impacts of, of this behavior on, on mothers, on children, on families, on, on society. Um, yeah, thank you for, for your time today as well. And thank you for answering our questions so thoroughly and so thoughtfully and comprehensively. Um, I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed the session today and found it really, really useful. Lots of food for thought um, to take away as well. Uh, so yeah we'll leave it there uh, and thank you everyone for coming as well everyone who's attended and shared your thoughts and your comments and your experiences in the chat as well thank you um thanks to everyone um it's been a pleasure to be with you today bye thanks bye everyone thank you bye